Okay, so this lecture is on regenerative medicine, and you'll see some of the topics we're going to cover. Um, there's a lot of links to videos that I encourage you to watch, but I won't pause. Sometimes if we were in face-to-face -face class, I would show you the videos, but I'll let you do that on your own. Um, so first I want to talk about the idea of cloning. So to clone comes from the Greek word twig, which means to make an exact copy. So I want to talk to you a little bit about um, different types of cloning. Um, two of them we've already talked about. So molecular cloning is really our recombinant DNA that we talked about at the beginning of the semester. So the whole idea is you're putting, you're making a new recombinant um, piece of DNA. So you're recombining DNA from different sources. And then when you put it into the E. coli and the E. coli divides and divides, divides, you have multiple identical copies of that plasmid. So that's molecular cloning. Therapeutic cloning, we've um, talked about in the idea of stem cells. And we've talked about um, how you can make your own, and we'll, we'll talk about this in just a minute, um, make your own stem cells by um, either uh, taking um, adult cells and reverting them to um, induced pluripotent cells, or through a um, method that we're going to talk about here called somatic cell nuclear transfer. I'll define this in a second. So, but the idea of therapeutic cloning is you're cloning cells for yourself. So you're making more of your own cells to treat a disease. Reproductive cloning is the idea of making an identical offspring. And we don't do this with humans, at least we're not supposed to, um, but we do do this with animals. So we'll talk about that. Um, let's first talk about this somatic cell nuclear transfer. So how could we do reproductive cloning or therapeutic cloning of self which we aren't really doing, but we have the technology to. Um, so what you need is you need the DNA from the organism. So from yourself, from the organism. Well, let's see. We're not going to do it from ourselves if we're talking about reproductive from the organism to be cloned. Right? And you need an egg. And so what you do here is you remove the egg, you remove the egg. You remove the nucleus from the egg. So it's called E nucleated. And you take the nucleus and we don't just take the DNA because it's too fragile. So we take the whole nucleus and we put it into that enucleated egg. So it's your DNA into an egg. That somatic cell, right, your body cell, nuclear transfer, so we're transferring the nucleus. And then the idea is that you can grow an embryo, and if you're doing reproductive cloning, you would put that into a surrogate mom and um, get a cloned animal 
So exact same DNA as this donor. So you've got your donor and you've got whoops, their clone. Okay. So um, this is a, a little quick one minute video that shows you um, how this kind of works. Um, let me show you some examples. So again, we're not doing this with humans, but we have done it with animals. So you may have heard of Dolly. Dolly was the first cloned mammal, cloned from an adult cell. Dolly was cloned in 1996. Um, so Dolly is the clone. And this is to show she had an offspring. So what they were trying to show is she was fully functional. Um, her DNA source was from the mammary gland of another sheep. And if you know who Dolly Parton is, Dolly Parton has really large mammary glands. And supposedly that is where Dolly the sheep got her name. Um, the donor was six years old. So it was an adult. And one of the controversies about Dolly the sheep was that um, she seemed to have a shortened life. She only lived to about the age of seven. Um, most sheep live to the age of 11 to 12. Um, she had arthritis, and when they looked at her DNA, she had shortened telomeres, so the ends of the DNA, which indicated she might have been kind of older than her age of seven. So um, I think we talked about how you lose during DNA replication, you lose a little bit of your telomeres, right? And telomerase is the enzyme that puts that back on and that is active in stem cells and it's not active in regular cells. So um, I think that Dolly may have kind of already started off a little old with shorter telomeres. Now, um, other scientists argued that wasn't the case and um, she was fine. But just to give you a little perspective, um, Dolly was one in 277 attempts. So they did 277 somatic cell nuclear transfers. From that, they got 29 embryos. They used 13 different surrogate moms and got one sheep. Very inefficient. Um, and as I mentioned before, um, the, the challenge here is that means you had to have 277 eggs to use, which means you had to get those eggs from um, somewhere. So, um, Dolly, though, was deemed a success, and animal cloning kept um, being looked at. Um, here is um, a, the, um, um, sorry, 2001, we had this cat, Rainbow, and she was cloned, and this is her genetic clone, copycat or carbon copy, I've seen her called both. Um, what I want you to see is you notice they don't look identical. And if you've taken genetics, you've hopefully learned about X inactivation and calico cats and know that their fur is determined by random X inactivation, their fur pattern. Um, so they have different epigenetics. And I like to use this example because um, people have to realize that if they're cloning their pet, 
you're not going to get the exact same pet, right? We know the idea of nature versus nurture, the environment that you grew up in um, affects your personality, it can affect your epigenetics, which can affect um, your health, your gene expression, um, all of that kind of stuff. But it was this big deal to be able to do pet cloning. Um, cats seemed for some reason to be um, easier than dogs. Dogs were quite um, a challenge. But Um, sorry, I had to see why that wasn't there. You could, can um, do your clone. So there used to be a company called Genetics, I'm sorry, Genetic Savings and Clone. Uh -huh -huh. And for $50,000, they would clone your cat. So they would take the, some tissue from your cat, do the somatic cell nuclear transfer, give you a new cat. Um, I think cat owners are fairly smart. Uh, I don't think this hit off, but boy, the dog owners. Um, a Korean company um, said they've cloned at least 600 dogs by 2015 at about $100,000. So genetic savings and clone is, is gone. And what they also would do, the savings part, was they would store down tissue from your animal so when the animal passed they would be able to clone it. Um, dogs, like I said, were a little bit um, more expensive so this dog is Sir Lancelot. Oh no, no. This dog is Sir Lancelot and Sir Lancelot was old he died of cancer in 2009. He was the first commercially cloned dog. And this little baby is called Lancelot Encore. And this couple paid $155,000 to clone Sir Lancelot. To clone a yellow lab. Boy, really rare dogs. But if you have money, uh, you can do things like that. Um, this is a picture of Barbara Streisand. Um, she got uh, two dogs cloned. She or she um, cloned her favorite dog. Got two um, puppies, just two clones. Um, the first cloned um, in 2004. Not not a pet, but a, a, another dog. Um, um, called Snuppy, an Afghan hound. I believe this was also in Korea. Um, it took 1,095 embryos. 123 surrogate dogs. But like I said, once they got the technology, um, they seem to just be able to do it much quicker. Um, there are, um, you can look up, I think I forgot to look up before this, there's a Texas company called Viagen that um, last time I looked, um, they'll clone your dog for 50,000, right? So a bargain. Cat, easy, only 25,000. And for $1,600, they'll preserve your animal's genetic information until you need it. So, you know, a great application of this is here. You know, kill your ch child's pet. Go ahead, clone it. This wasn't really their advertisement, but I thought it was pretty funny. All right, so reproductive cloning we can um, definitely do with animals. Here's um, a list of these different animals that have been um, cloned using somatic cell nuclear transfer. So um, why not, right? Here's a way maybe we can bring back um, a 
extinct species. All right. So, woolly mammoth, um, you know, you would have to have an egg and you would have to have a surrogate mom. And while there's a lot of work going on um, recreating the woolly mammoth genome, you know, and this, the next closest relative would be an elephant. And you can see there's quite a size difference. Um, so would an elephant be able to carry a woolly mammoth embryo fetus? I don't know, um, but ideas, you know, we've got lots of ideas. Um, this is a Pyrenean ibex. Um, this beautiful animal went extinct in 2000. And in 2003, they made a clone. So they had stored down some tissue, um, but unfortunately it died right after birth. It had a lung defect. Um, it again took 493 embryos. 57 transplants. seven pregnancies in a goat. So they had to use a you know, related animal, one birth that died. So um, animal cloning is not very efficient, um, but there are options and people are thinking about using this as a way to um, bring back extinct species, um, a way to make herds of um, animals. So um, we heard to talk about hornless cows. Um, perhaps they could try to um, take the DNA from one of those hornless cows that did not have the plasma DNA in it and do somatic cell nuclear transfer. But you can imagine the cost of this probably cheaper to remove the horns. Um, so, <clears throat> again, back to therapeutic cloning. We're not going to make a clone of you, but we're going to do this same kind of somatic cell nuclear transfer to make embryonic stem cells to make genetically matched tissue. So if you could get an egg donor, um, this is a potential. Um, again, you, you've got to have an egg donor. There are definitely some ethics involved in making um, an embryo. And you have to get the reprogramming. So the reprogramming means epigenetics. Remember, epigenetics are signals on top of your DNA that are really involved in gene regulation. And um, maybe you learned in um, genetics that when the egg and sperm get together and they start to divide. There are epigenetic reprogramming that goes on um, to be able to form an embryo. And that happens um, naturally, obviously in um, an organism, in the um, fetus to grow. But when you put this in a Petri dish, you've got different issues. It's not the same environment. Okay, um, so we've already talked about stem cells and where they came from. Um, the reason, again, I'm bringing back up stem cells is for therapeutic cloning, and we kind of talked about there's this kind of blurred line between stem cells and regenerative medicine. Um, for regenerative medicine, to make it your self tissue, we need some of your stem cells. 
So this is kind of a definition of regenerative medicine, branch of medicine that develops methods to regrow, repair, or replace damaged or diseased cells, organs, or tissues. Okay. Um, I've given you two links here. Um, this is a really good overview on the bottom. Where's my, oops. Um, and here's a, a place you can get some of the latest news. So let's talk about different types of regenerative medicine. I highly recommend you take a few minutes and watch this Growing Miracles short little um, news videos, um, but pretty interesting. Um, this is an example of a man whose fingertip was cut off, um, and um, there's a company called um, Acel, and they sell this regenerative medicine matrix. And basically, it's um, extracellular matrix from pig bladder. that they make in um, powder form or um, sheets, and it helps your body regrow tissue. And this is an example of the fingertip that was um, regrown. So there's some pretty amazing stories. Um, I actually had a student who worked for ACEL for a while. It was uh, pretty cool. She got to go into um, surgery rooms and help talk the doctors through how to apply this matrix. Um, it's primarily used on like wounds, burns, ulcers, um, but you can watch in these videos um, about it used to regrow this fingertip. Now, this might gross you out uh, too. I should have warned you before, but um, I will give you a warning. This is my um, fingertip from my finger. Um, my warning is don't drink and use sharp objects. I was um, drinking wine and cutting material with a nice um, very sharp rotary cutter for a quilt and uh, one night um, just sliced off the tip of my finger. Um, I was too embarrassed to go to the emergency room or anything so I just packed it with band-aids but you can see it was, it's pretty cool like it was really cool you could actually see the layers of tissue and I put it in this little glass jar and my husband accidentally put it down the garbage disposal but my finger has regrown without any regenerative medicine I do have some weird feelings here um, but uh, our bodies are pretty freaking amazing uh, so I just thought I'd share a little personal information um, I don't recommend it <laughs> Um, this is a cool video um, showing you this regenerative medicine um, skin cell spray gun. So you're basically growing cells um, from the patient, so growing their own cells and then putting it in this um, like an airbrush and painting the uh, cells back onto the patient and letting the, uh, the cells regrow. So this is to avoid having to do a big skin graft. Um, sometimes they would use um, pig skin to help um, uh, treat burns. Um, and so you can imagine the skin isn't quite the same. Um, so go ahead and watch that video. It's pretty cool. Um, you can't even tell where this guy was burned um, after this treatment. Okay. What about making artificial organs? So, um, some kind of cool applications of regenerative medicine. Um, this has been a very successful, this is a bladder that has been grown um, uh, in the lab. So here are links to some articles, or uh, yeah, I think these words are articles. Um, this, is really um, scaffolding that they implanted into the, under this mouse's skin and then the skin was able to grow over the ear. And this was like, oh my gosh, this mouse is growing an ear on the back of, on their back, which 
it was just growing the skin over, but this was actually later used. Um, this uh, is a soldier who lost her ear in a car accident, and so they took cartilage from her ribs, made this ear formation, so she could actually still hear, but she lost that whole outside part of her ear. So they implanted the cartilage under her skin. Um, it grew skin around it, and then they were able to put it back on um, to the side of her head so um, that she would look more normal versus having missing an ear. So, um, well, let's just keep going about how we can kind of make these different organs. Um, bioprinting. So we talked, we had a talk a little bit about some 3D printing. This is 3D printing with cells. So it's called bioprinting and um, you basically can reproduce um, with an inkjet. Um, one of the first 3D printers was actually printing cells. So they took the ink out of a regular ink cartridge and put cells in there and saw that they could put layer by layer by layer um, of cells. So um, you make usually a scaffold. Right? You layer it with cells. And then what we're doing a lot right now is testing it. So stretching it. Um, can it go in the body? Can it function um, where it needs to? So um, this is pretty cool uh, technology that they're working on. Um, I'm going to show you. Um, there's lots of, like I said, um, links on these next pages if you want to look um, at some more or get ideas for a biotech in the news. Um, but like I said, it all starts with cells and you have a scaffold. So even with that bladder, they would make a scaffold and then you'd put the cells over it so that it's growing into this kind of um, tissue. Um, this is, they were making um, muscles, um, these cool bioprinting machines, and then looking at ways to test before we implant. We got to make sure that these organs that we're making can withstand, um, what am I trying to say? Can withstand the mechanical stress of being in a body. Um, they have done some implantations into um, animals and they have been able to get these organs um, integrated. Um, the blood vessels have come and integrated into these artificial organisms. Um, they've been able to make um, blood vessels, muscles, tendons. Um, let's just keep looking. So um, Organovo is um, trying to make whole organs. So I want you to think organs versus tissue. So if you're making, even though your skin is an organ, um, you may be making something more simple, but an organ, if we think about the liver or the kidney, um, this one, da, 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 da. they've made liver and kidney. Organs are really complex, right? With multiple tissue types, so multiple cell types. And you need to integrate blood supply. Right? And you've got to get these different tissues to work together. Um, so Organovo has said that they have been able to print liver and kidney. Now these aren't full. Um, this is more like, well, I haven't seen anything that they've developed actually an entire liver. Um, but they're using these multiple tissues, and this is kind of like what we're going to talk about in a minute too with body on a chip that you've heard about, is... Um, for drug testing or kind of a pharmacogenomics test 
your response. Response to a drug. So maybe um, you're having some liver issues and they want to see which drug you're going to respond to. So they take a little bit of your tissue, they grow up cells, they print a pretend liver for you, they test um, specific drugs to see how your genetics will interact. So much more complicated than getting a genetic test and looking at the label for a drug. But um, whenever you're promoting, right, you want to get investors or you're writing grants to get money, you always have to think of the big picture. So personalized medicine by um, printing some of your own tissue and testing it out is kind of one of the draws, um, big, big ideas from this. This I found I thought was pretty dang cool. Um, and you got to watch, this is like a three minute, two minute video. This toddler, right, it's a little kid, two year old, received a kidney from her dad. Now, you can imagine there's a size issue. So what this surgeon did is he took an image of her pelvic area where he needed to put the kidney and an image, so these aren't real, these are just used for practice, of the father's kidney and practiced his surgery so that when they were there with the daughter, they didn't have to kind of figure out how to fit this kidney from the dad into the little toddler. Pretty cool, so 3D printing for surgery practice. Um, this is just a page with a lot of links about um, bioprinting, 3D printing, um, um, how they're making uh, bones, um, cartilage. So again, if this is something you're interested in, you can click on these and look for more up-to-date um, articles. But uh, the idea is maybe we can make replacement organs in the lab someday so we don't have to have this long wait for um, people waiting for um, organ donation. Body on a chip. Um, um, talked, Kate talked a little bit about um, this idea of organs on a chip. Again, they're not full organs, but they're um, fluid channels. So you can see the green is a fluid channel that circulates and goes through these different types of, so, tissue types. So you could have a drug that you're checking um, and see what happens when it goes through gut tissue or liver or kidney. Um, see the effects of, from a lung, an aerosol drug. So this is a big goal. And right now we're working on individual organs, but to one day have a body on a chip to replace animal testing for um, drugs, to look at diseases. Um, just so you know, in 2015, MIT got $32 million, and Harvard got $37 million. Uh, kind of interesting. Um, where we are right now. Millions don't seem like much when we're talking about billion and trillion dollar bailouts, but um, there has been money to work on these organ on a chip. So again, big idea, personalized. So maybe if we got this technology, we could make your own personal chip and figure out what medicines worked best for you. Um, so Kate already talked about um, lung on a chip, um, that you can, you can make it breathe. Um, they've looked at um, exposing it to bacteria and it acted just as they expected um, lung tissues to react. So um, as you see here, and, and Kate had showed, you, you're starting to get different um, tissue layers, so tissues can uh, interact. Um, on a chip. I just have to show you because I just think it's amazing. 
that heart cells will beat on their own. Um, so if you watch this, you can see it contracting. Yeah. So you can actually grow heart cells and when they get together, they will start um, sending the signals through the gap junctions and uh, contracting in an organized manner. Pretty amazing, I think. Uh, we... Liver on a chip would be important um, for toxicity um, and drug testing. Last I read, um, they could do this for about $22,000 per test. Um, but they said that's actually cheaper and faster than doing all the mice work. So again, um, I think it's pretty cool to maybe be able to reduce um, the number of animals that we have to use for uh, research. Um, organoids are a little bit different. Okay. So these are going to be 3D cultures of organized cell type. Oh, sorry, organized cells. So now we're really trying to make a liver, and these are still microscopic, okay, so don't think we're there. Um, about five millimeters, really little. Um, so seeing if we can put uh, cells together and they can self-organize, self-renew into these um, little organoids. So again, something better than cell culture and maybe better than um, animal models. So something right in the middle. Um, but what's not happening with these little organoids is they're not all interacting. So like the cool thing about uh, the idea of a body on a chip is you could see how your liver metabolizes this drug and then how did that drug affect the kidney or the bone or the heart or the gut. Um, versus these cool little organoid, organoids um, that are kind of functioning on their own. And they're still trying to figure out how to get connective tissue and neuronal tissue and immune cells and, and really make a um, more functional body. Um, but, um, yeah, so you've got lungs, you've got your gut, you've got liver. Um, this is supposedly a mini brain. Um, between both of these, so the neurons and um, the brain. So organoids, kind of cool. Um, they have been able to grow blood vessels in a petri dish, so this was um, used to look at vascular disease, especially um, they were looking at it as a model for diabetes, um, because with diabetes a lot of people have impaired blood circulation and oxygen flow, but they said this could also be applied to Alzheimer's, cardiovascular, wound healing, stroke, cancer. So I just grabbed some pictures from um, this paper down at the bottom to show you um, this, this 3D model of blood vessels that they were able to grow in the lab. And they did transplant these into mice and they developed into um, functional blood vessels something kind of totally different, but I guess this was pretty exciting, was to um, take cells from, um, this one was from a Cape Coral Cobra. Now this is not the right picture, but I just wanted to show you. Um, so they took um, egg cells from a Cape Coral Cobra um, they made these venom gland organoids and they produce venom. Really cool because it may help with studying and harvesting antivenom. So traditionally to study snake venom, you milk the snake, right? So you gotta capture the snake you got to um, do this milking so its fangs excrete um, that venom. You can imagine you're not getting a lot. Um, you got to deal with these uh, deadly snakes. Um, so what you can do with this idea of a 
venom gland organoid is you can grow these and harvest a whole lot of venom. Um, the next step you would do to make anti-venom here is inject the venom into a horse and then harvest antibodies. Right? So the anti-venom is really antibodies that are going to go bind to that toxin, that venom, and prevent it from acting on your cells. What they're hoping to do now is have this organoid venom and um, be able to maybe uh, figure out a chemical anti-venom because they can make so much and study it. Um, they say that 5.4 million people are bitten each year by venomous snakes. Um, somewhere between 81,000 and 138,000 people die each year from snake bites. Um, so here is a way to study that and maybe again make some protective drugs. Um, I don't know if you technically call this regenerative medicine, my next couple slides, but I think they're pretty um, amazing uh, examples of what we're doing with medicine and I consider it biotechnology. Um, this cute guy, uh, Zion, um, when Zion was two, he had a very bad bacterial infection. He lost both hands and his feet, had a kidney transplant from his mom. And so at age eight, they decided to try a hand transplant. He got two brand new hands. Um, really uh, cool video um, of him as a, a little kid, oh, just a sweetie. Um, here's some more information about him at age 10 and the idea of how he's been able to integrate these hands and you can you can see where they're attached on. Um, he's now 12, um, supposedly doing just great. So kind of a cool, um, I don't, it's not really technically regenerative, although, you know, there's a lot of tissue melding um, going on in this kid. Face transplants. Um, my uh, class last year was really curious about face transplants. Um, definitely not my specialty, but um, all of these people had lost their face through um, accident or um, uh, some from attempted suicide or disease. And there were donor people who donated their faces and they were able to connect this whole face onto these people. Um, so if you're interested in face transplants, look through um, these articles. Pretty fascinating uh, technology. Okay, so that's a whole bunch of, of kind of related, crazy different topics. I think really cool stuff that I wanted to share with you about um, technology and regenerative medicine. So um, your pre-discussion homework, there's an assignment posted on Canvas. Um, just some of the questions you're going to answer. Um, I, want, I really want you to be sure you understand cell, uh, somatic cell nuclear transfer different kinds of um, cloning, the role of stem cells, what is regenerative medicine, and then um, these are some kind of application questions. So I want you to write down your answers to these and then um, obviously have a copy with you when we talk um, in class on Wednesday. And um, I want to see if you guys can come up with scenarios on um, how you might deal um, with, with uh, these concept questions. Okay, this sure is not as fun as uh, talking to you in class and seeing reactions, but um, there we are. All right, I'll see you in class Wednesday.